Well, good morning. Please, you may be seated. Thank you for such a, a warm welcome and to allow us the privilege of being here with our great friends, Pastor Benny and Wendy, and also to meet our family now, because we've heard so much about you. Your pastors boast about you everywhere they go, and I can see why. It's, it's such a joy to be here. Pastor Benny mentioned about the Church LV being known as a church of generosity. I can tell you, you already are, because you are so generous with your ministers in our nations of New Zealand, and we, we spent quite a bit of time in Australia. Uh, your pastors have made such an impact in that part of the world, going back 15 or 20 years, back to our Planet Shakers days, for our church, our nations. And you know, already the fruitfulness of this church, uh, you, you have like this tree of fruit. You have orchards in areas of the world you may not have even seen, but you have that there. And I, and I need to say this because I need to really honor your pastors because what they have added into our nations is, is not just intangible, it's not just generic of, you know, different things, it's, it's specific. It really is. And what it is, is it's the ability to have taken people from presence into encounter. Wow. From presence into encounter. Because you know, you can be in the presence of greatness. The presence of God is everywhere. You can, you can be sitting on a bus, you can be in a restaurant, and, and some person of great fame is present. doesn't mean you've encountered them. Wow. And what I love about your pastors from the time I've known over 20 years is their mission has always been to bring people in whatever environment they're in, whatever that meeting is, to take the presence of God, bring people to encounter yeah. His presence in such a way that people now want nothing less. Yeah. And I've been a benefactor of that, and I want to honor you, Pastor Benny and Wendy, for what you've done, and I want to thank you as a church as well. So now it's my joy to be here and to share with you, and I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have them with you, to Mark chapter 5. You'll see on our screens, I'm going to talk to you about a, a subject called interruptions on the journey of faith. See, we could talk about the journey of faith. We could talk about what you leave behind, what you take with you, how you find it, how you start it, how you finish it. But today I want to talk to you particularly about interruptions on the journey of faith. Because they happen. And they don't just happen. How we respond to them often determines whether or not we get to see the fulfillment of that journey or not. We're going to hitchhike this morning. Any hitchhikers here? And we're going to hitchhike for a moment on another man's journey. A man by the name of Jairus. And I want to say from the outset, you know, my prayer today is that not one of us here would ever have to experience the conditions that led to this man's journey. I, I pray that so sincerely, but we can still learn so much because this man Jairus had to go on perhaps the most awful, most challenging journey any parent, any man or woman could ever go on. I want to read you these first few verses found in Mark chapter 5 verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, and he pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come. Put your hands upon her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. It's a journey that no mother, no father would ever want to take. It's such a journey of faith because we find ourselves in a situation observing that this man has a little girl. We're told later in Scripture she's 12 years of age. She's not just sick, she's dying. And in the last moments, perhaps the last hours of her life, her father has to make the hardest decision that anyone could ever make to actually prize himself away from the arms of his daughter that he's holding in her last moments just on the possibility that maybe the rumors he's heard are true. That somewhere there's a man who can touch the sick and heal the sick. You see, we're not told anywhere in Scripture that Jairus had ever seen Jesus, had ever met Jesus, or even knew of Jesus. He'd only heard about a man. He'd only heard a rumor that there was this man who, who people were saying could do these things. Right, right. But we also told in context here that he's a synagogue ruler. 
That means he was in an environment where there was as many voices that said no about Jesus as there were about yes about Jesus. He was amongst the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the ones who said, no, no, this man's a sham. He's not who he says he is. So he is this man, and we know it's a journey of faith for the very simple reason. He has no assurance that he can find him. He has no assurance that even if he does, that Jesus will listen to him, let alone come with him. And in this moment, this man's journey of faith begins on a possibility that there's nothing else I can do. He prizes himself away from his daughter's arms, travels a number of hours journey to where he's heard this man is nearby on the hope that maybe Jesus will listen. And we read these words that as he falls at the feet of Christ and takes a hold of his feet, he begs him, Jesus, please, my girl, my little baby, she's sick, she's dying. Would you come with me? Would you lay your hands on her that she would get well? The scripture tells us that Jesus simply went with him. It's not recorded that Jesus said, I'll heal her. It's not recorded that Jesus said that, that she'll be okay. It just says that Jesus went with him. And can I say to us that on our journeys of faith, because we are all on them and many of them, don't leave home without him. If there's any one thing we got to do is at least take Jesus with us. Whether you can hear him talk, whether you've got an assurance or not, the thing is take Jesus with you. So now we have this man's journey, desperate journey. Thinking of distance, time, hours, sickness, how long? Will we get there in time? If we get there, will it work? I don't know, but I'm, I've got to try this. There's no other hope available. And so with the last words we read in that verse are that Jesus went with him. But then we start to read some other words. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So at once Jesus, realizing that power had gone out from him, turns around to the crowd and asks a question. Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you? The disciples answered, huh? Like you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done this. And the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Oh, I mean, th that is the most beautiful story of faith right there. A woman pushing through a crowd, touching Jesus, power leaving him, her becoming healed. We, we, we've heard so many messages. I've preached so many times. We love the story of the woman with the issue of blood, one who could push through a crowd. We love it. But I've got a question I want to ask. Whose journey is this? Like, is this the story of the 12-year-old girl dying or the bleeding woman? Is this the story of Jairus or, or is this a story of a, a woman who's got an issue? Now, now, don't get me wrong. What condition this woman had was painful, shameful, terrible. For 12 years, and it's no coincidence it's 12 years. For this woman has suffered and managed this illness for 12 years, but we're told in both Luke 8 and Mark 5 that this girl is 12 years of age. And so whilst we celebrate that Jesus' attention has now turned to focus on a need, another person's need, a genuine need, a real need. But i got to be honest to you, that, that need's not like this need. And I want to ask you a question, how does Jairus handle that interruption? When he's got a time limit and he's got a daughter who he has made the hugest decision of his life. I've, honey, I've got to let you go. You don't understand. You're sick. But I've got one chance and one chance only. And I've got to find this man, this one person who might be able to save your life. 
And he's on his journey, and he's looking at it as equivalent to his watch, and he's working out, I don't even know if he'll get there in time. And now Jesus is busy with someone else. And don't tell me that doesn't happen in your life, because it happens in my life. And sometimes we look at this and we go, you know, Jesus, I can't figure this out. It's like you've said you'll go with me. You know the situation, but it's like, it's like you're doing stuff in other people's lives. You see, 12 years, this woman had had an issue of bleeding. It, it was painful. It was shameful. This woman would be ostracized from society because of the embarrassment of this. She had suffered greatly. Her need was significant. But I, I got to tell you, 12 years, she's managed it. And we could be like, Jesus, why don't you just park that up for a moment? Why don't you just give her this, this assurance that when you come back, you'll find her? Because, Jesus, you, it's not like you just heal her. You stop and you turn this into a teaching session. You make this a small group meeting. You start using her as an illustration. You start dealing. And in the meantime, we've got Jairus. He, he's over here and he's looking at his watch. And he's like, Jesus, what is going on here? And this is messed up. Because it's, it's like God does things the way no one else would. And we actually don't understand. Because you see, you've got to understand. And there are people here in this great church. And you, you've worked in the medical profession. You understand triage. The principle of triage is that when an emergency occurs, maybe like a car wreck, and, and limited resources get there, it might be two paramedics turn up, but there's actually three or four injured. Every one of those medical professionals are trained to execute the principle of triage, to put in a hierarchy and order of what I respond to first. Yeah. And here's the truth. Some guy in that car wreck might be screaming out because his arm's broken. He's got a compound fracture. He's in pain. He's shouting the loudest. But that medical professional will walk past that man to deal to someone else who's on the ground silent and unresponsive because that's the bigger matter. That's the most important. It's like Jesus takes the principle of triage and he throws it up in the air and like disregards it. Because 12 years she's been suffering, but she's managed it 12 years of age. And the girl is dying. So I want to ask the question, when I'm Jairus and I'm watching that, what am I thinking? And it gets worse. I'm sorry, but it gets worse before it gets better. Because he hears words that we celebrated. And when I read it, you said, amen. But he goes, oh, no. Because as he's listening, Jesus now doing his teaching lesson says, no, no, I know someone touched me. And the disciples are all like, what? The? I mean, like, this is like a mosh pit at the church LV and the services when they're all up the front here and the youth. And, and you're like, who touched me? Jesus, everyone's touching you. And Jesus says, no, 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 you don't understand. I felt power leave me. Leave me. Now, now I'm, I'm Jairus, and I'm like, no! I need that power power left you. No, no, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm never going to compare the power of Christ and healing to a cell phone battery, but I can relate. <laughs> You've all been there. Like you, you, you're in the shopping mall, you're somewhere, you're trying to be picked up or meet your spouse or your mom and dad or something. And you're like down to like 3% and it's going quicker than the first 3%. And you're like, oh my goodness, the power's leaving it. And then I'm going to be lost. And no, 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 I can't contact. Like Jairus is here and he hears Jesus say, power left me. So you, you've got to read this and understand. This is not Nickelodeon. This is not Disney. This is, this, is not, this is not Aesop's fables or Hans Christian Andersen. These are not fairy tales. These are stories that happen to people with flesh and blood and emotion and spirit. And, and, and he doesn't understand that Jesus has unlimited power. He's gone there on a rumor that maybe, just maybe, this man has enough power to heal. And then he hears that the power has gone out from him. And I can imagine Jairus crying out, no. Every interruption in your journey of faith creates a crossroad in your journey that you make a decision on how to respond. Like, what do you do when God's working in someone else's life in the very area that you need most? Like, maybe you've been in a situation, you, you've, you've had 
a redundancy or an unemployment or business that, that it's going under. And you're like crying out to God, your father, who you love and you know intimately. And you're crying out, God, you've got to come through. I need that job. I need that position. I need that, 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 that opportunity for my business to, to, to stay solvent. You're crying out. And you've been doing that for months. And you're right on the edge. And then somebody steps up to this platform and, and Pastor Wendy or Pastor Benny is introducing them. They say, look, I got a story. Two weeks ago, I lost my job. I walked down the car park and I'm about to drive and the phone rings. <laughs> Come on, you've been there. And they're testifying and they're saying, you know what? And I got this job and a promotion and this and that. And, and, and the whole church, as we should, is just going off. Like that is awesome. But you're over here going, hey, God, <laughs> three months, God, three months. <laughs> like what, 24 hours? See, don't tell me it doesn't happen. You know, we've all got loved ones who we're praying will come into relationship with Jesus. Receive his gift of forgiveness. You know, you, you might be in this meeting today, and for whatever reason, you would say to me, Pastor, I can hear what you're saying. I like the story, but, but I'm distant from God. I, I, I don't have relationship with God. I, you know what? The good news for you is that before the end of this message, this meeting, there'll, there'll be an opportunity for you to receive that forgiveness, for you to give your life fully to Christ. But we've all been in meetings where we've been praying for weeks and months, God, and sometimes years. Save my children, save my parents, save my spouse, save my friends. And we're like desperately crying out. You see, I've got a beautiful young lady in my church. Her name's Kim. She's probably, I don't know, late 30s, 40s. She's a beautiful lady. She's been confined to a wheelchair all her life with cerebral palsy. She can communicate somewhat uh, clearly. She's sharp mind, but her body just doesn't allow her to do stuff. And I can tell you without a word of exaggeration that at least two or three Sundays out of every month, she brings that wheelchair to the prayer altar call. And many times she's crying, literally filling that, that tray on her, her wheelchair with, with the wetness of her tears. And she looks at me and she says, Pastor, please pray for me. Please, please, please pray for me. And she doesn't want prayer for her or her condition, though she's believing that God will heal she looks at me and she says, Pastor, my mom and my dad, they're so old now and mom's not been well. And they still don't know Jesus. And I so want them to find Jesus before they die. Pastor, would you pray with me for my mom and dad? This has been year after year after year for three to five years. And every time I take a hand, I say, Kim, your mom and dad are alive and breathing. And they know she says, but Pastor, they blame God for me. They blame God for what's happened to me. I don't, but they blame God. And I, I, I speak encouragement to her, and I, I say, come on, God will reveal and, and soften their heart and hearts. But she is crying. I, I want my mom and dad to know Jesus. I want them to go to heaven. And they're old. And then like your church, we see these great moves of God and souls being saved. Just 18 months ago in our church, one of our local high schools, we had a huge move of God that's gone on for nearly two years with, with dozens and dozens and dozens of students giving their life to Christ, from the drug dealers to the, to the football players to the, 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 the students who are achieving to the ones who are broken. Like, like, I could show you photos where literally our platform from start to finish is filled with young people about to get baptized. And they're standing there and they're testifying. And, and as a pastor, like your pastors, this is my moment. I, I, I get wrecked at baptisms. I mean, I love so much about the kingdom, but give me baptisms, I'm wrecked. I just love it. And they're testifying. But you know what made my heart better? Pastor Wendy, you know what made my heart better? You know this as a mom. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm six months later, another baptism with the same number of people. But this time, it's like, it's like these adults as well as these kids. And, and it's, it's the moms and dads of the kids who have got saved, and they're telling their story. They're telling their story, and like, it's like a Lucy there. She says, this is my mom, you know, and, and, and when I gave my life to Jesus six months ago, she didn't believe in God, and three months ago, she came to church and came back two or three times. By the way, if you're visiting here, come back a few times, you'll change. You won't stay the same. Her mom 
two, three, four times. And then finally, your heart just goes, I want this. I want this, right? And we're clapping like you and I'm like, I love that. But you know what? Whilst these mums are like two, three months and they're saved, I'm thinking about Kim. I'm asking God, what about Kim? How's she feeling? Because you see, down the back, Kim could be like, you know what, God, I've prayed for years and years and years. And these young people, it's like a month, two, and the parents are getting saved and they're young. They've got 30, 40 years of life. She could take that as an offense or she could take that as the gift. Because I'm now about to tell you why this happened. We think this is an interruption on the journey of faith. No, no, no. This is a setup. This is actually a setup. This is Jesus actually taking a moment to do the best thing he could ever give to this man, Jairus. And I'll tell you how I know that. Because you see, Jairus has never seen a miracle in his life that we know of. He's never seen someone healed. He, he's trusting in a word that maybe this Jesus can do. And so what we think is an interruption, he's watching and thinking, how, how do we get there in time? Jesus is demonstrating right before his very eyes the thing that Jairus is about to need more than anything else. <clears throat> and I'll tell you how I know. So you, you, when you look and you read this living word, you've got you to see why things connect. Nothing happens in Scripture without context and, and purpose and relationship. You notice what happens here because you see for a moment, it's actually going to get a lot worse for Jairus before it gets a lot better. Because yeah. I want you to listen to exactly how it says. In verse 34, Jesus has stopped, he's taken moments, he's healed her, he's talking to the disciples, the crowd, he's speaking to her, and then listen to what it says, verse 34. He says to her daughter, notice he doesn't call this woman woman, or even her name, he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Daughter, healed you. Daughter, faith, healed. Daughter, faith, healed. He's speaking these words into this atmosphere. Daughter, faith, healed you. Go in peace. Be free. Next verse. While Jesus was still speaking, whilst he was still speaking, what was he speaking? Daughter, faith, healed. Daughter. Whilst Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and says, your daughter's dead. Your daughter's dead. Don't bother. Don't bother the teacher. Stop walking with Jesus. It's over. Your daughter, daughter, dead. Daughter, dead. Daughter, daughter, your faith healed. Daughter, faith healed. There will always be two voices. There will always be two voices. Two voices. Two sounds. You see, this is no interruption. This is no interruption. This is a setup. You see, Jesus loves this woman. He wanted to minister to her. But to be honest, he knew he could have got back to her. No, no, he allowed this moment. Because he knew before they'd even reached Jairus' house, Jairus' faith that hung like a thread was about to be ripped apart and broken by the words, it's over. Daughter is dead. Whilst Jesus is speaking, daughter, your faith has healed you. You see, within the context of every person's testimony is your faith flow and life and energy. You see, for a Kim sitting at the back in that wheelchair or sitting off to the side where she often sits, she's not listening to someone's mom and dad got saved and therefore I'm jealous and I'm angry and God overlooks me and God misses me. No, no, she's at the back there going, yeah, Jesus, one more, one day closer. You can save her mom. You can save her dad. You can save his mom. Oh, I'll take that. I'll take that. Come on up here, Griffin. Come on up here, Michael. I want to show you what happens in your interruptions of faith. Come on up here, Griffin. And Michael. Nice to meet you, Michael. This young man's been looking after me so well. Nice to meet you too. Come and stand over here, guys. You see, has anyone ever needed this? Anyone own a car like five or ten years old? This is your best friend, you know. You see, we, we read what happened with this woman. 
I want to, for a moment, just teach you about the power of testimony. See, every single time, whether it's here, for people who are listening, streaming, whether it's something that you hear over, over the streaming or an internet or in a small group as we gather together, and someone's like saying as a leader, hey, anyone got any testimonies this week? And someone's like, yeah, you know, I, I, I had this healing thing happen. I don't know what it was, but I had like this RSI on my, and by the way, there's someone here with the RSI. And, and there's a number actually. But there's one person here, you're about to consider ending your career and changing to something because of that. And the problem is it's the thing you feel God's called you to do, and it's someone on the side of the meeting. And it's, it's, it's bothering you. And I actually, I, I, I don't think it's like your computer thing. I think it's actually to do with a, a trade or something. I want, to, I want you to believe for healing today. I want you to believe for healing today, that God will restore that tendonitis, restore that RSI, and that that thing you're called to do, working with your hands, will be brought back. But, you know, you could be in a small group meeting and someone's like, you know, Jesus, heal me of this RSI. And, I, and that, you're not, they're just not telling that only for God's glory. That's God's gift to you. Because you're like, I've been battling asthma for five years, asthma and breathing. You see, what, what you've got to realize is, see, every testimony is a hookup. This thing for Jairus was a hookup. Because what happens, you see, and, and what I need, I need you guys to stand just like here, about there. Michael, just stand there. I want to show you what happens, right? So, uh, so Michael, in this case, don't worry about the gender issue, right? It's like, it's like Michael is like this woman, you see. And, and you've got Jairus here. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, hey, man, it's because you're masculine and you've got a creative side. Handle it well. You see... In a, in a jump lead, any electrical circuit has to have a negative and a positive, right? This is a, this is a negative polarity. And so when you get a battery, you put the negative on the negative and the positive on that. This man has got this negative. My daughter's dying. My daughter's sick and dying, right? This is just dangling here because it's like this. It's, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe this Jesus can heal. I, I've heard rumors. I, I heard a rumor that he did something. In this town near Galilee, but but it's, he doesn't even know if he can hold it. But he, but this is real, man. This is his daughter. Remember, no no Disneyland on this. This is his daughter, and he's holding this thing, and he's got this negative. And what's worse now is these men have come from his house and said, "I'm sorry, man. This is your life. This is it. It's over. Stop walking with Jesus. Leave the teacher alone." You see, and whilst Jesus seems to have his back to Jairus' need and is ministering to this woman and touching. And he's like, Jesus, like, what is this? You see, Jesus is actually about to hook this up and use the power of what he does here to fuel this man for the rest of his journey. Because you see, she can relate, left hand here. She can relate to this. Because she's like, you know what? I know what it is to suffer, to be ostracized and shamed and pain. So within a testimony... One of the most powerful things is when you hear a testimony, it's someone whose story has changed. The most powerful thing is you can identify not just to what God's done, but what God needed to do. But here's the difference, you see. The woman's healed now. She knows his touch. She felt power. And so this, this is what is her situation, or in this case, like whatever's happening in your life. When you're listening to someone, when a friend shares and goes, look, you know that thing? God got me the job. God provided this finance. God healed this. God saved my, my mom, my dad. It's like this. And, and all of a sudden, what happens is, huh, this man Jairus is like, it can happen. She's, she's suffered 12 years, and this man touches her. And it's like, it's like this, this, this flow. You see, there are people in this room who could explain it better than I can. But anyone who understands physics will tell you the way an electrical circuit works, it has to have a negative and positive. But when the positive is connected, it literally moves the electrons and the eons and drives out the negative ones and fires it up. So this man's battery that was running all along, his car battery was full of power. All of a sudden, this man with no battery, everything's dead, goes kaboom, kaboom, and the engine starts, and he's full of it. Thanks, guys, if you could step away. You, you see, just these last couple of minutes, let me tell you why the interruption had to take place. Because as his journey still hadn't reached its end, it was about to get worse and could have ended early. We fast forward the story. And all of a sudden, you've got, you, you, you've got Jairus there. And now he's seen a miracle. The Bible continues to say that as Jesus was speaking, daughter, your faith healed. 
daughter dead. Daughter, you'll always have two voices. Daughter, faith healed. Jesus walks over to Jairus, makes him the center of Jesus' attention, looks straight at him and says, Jairus, don't fear. Only believe. And then he radically turns to the crowd, the disciples, and he says, you know what? From this point on, this man's journey's changed. It's actually got a lot harder. His daughter's not just sick now, she's dead. So actually, now I'm choosing to take some with me and leave others behind. It says from that moment, he only ever took James, Peter, and John. Like Thomas is there. He's like, what? what? And Jesus is like, no, no, Thomas, honestly, believe me, we don't need you. Thomas is okay. Two years, trust me. You're going to touch the palm of my hand. The way you think is going to change. But actually, Thomas, no. Doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas, no. I'll come back for you. Matthew, no, Matthew, no, Matthew. Matthew, tax collector, analytical, statistical, you know, oh, man, infant mortality rates and this child. No, no, we don't need faith, hope, and love. You say, who's Peter, James, and John? The Bible describes them as faith, hope, and love. The apostle of faith, the apostle of love. Peter's the guy who will always step out. James is the one all through his books. He writes, count it joy when you go through trials. And he speaks of hope. John, the disciple who Jesus loved. Because you see, as they start to walk now. And worship team, please come back as I'm speaking. As they start to walk, Jairus' head is filled with two voices. Daughter, daughter dead. Daughter healed, daughter dead. Daughter, And suddenly this big, hairy fisherman's arm gets right around his shoulder. Jairus! It's going to be okay. Peter, what do you mean? My daughter's dead. How can that be okay? No, you don't understand, man. This guy, he's not like, he doesn't just do stuff natural. We saw this dude, Lazarus, come alive again. I stepped out of a boat once and and, and you don't understand. I walked on water. You can't walk on water. Your daughter might be dead, but it's not over. James comes, looks at her. Hey, come on, man, have hope. Have hope. I've seen people who've reached situations, nothing can change, but they hang on and hope. And Jesus, John gets in between, stops them walking for a minute. Hug me, hug me, hug Jairus. Like Jesus, like, come on, John, hug him on the way, right? (laughs) John is all about love. Oh, Jairus, Jesus loves your daughter as much as he loves that woman. Jairus loves you, man. And all of a sudden, faith, hope, and love are walking. Everything else is left. They get to the house. They open the door. Jesus takes everyone out, only lets mom, dad, faith, hope, and love come in. Looks at the girl, touches her, raises her to life. Hands her back to mom and dad. And his journey of faith. You see, right at that point, when the men came from Jairus' house, the journey would have been over. But Jesus set it up. And he's setting you up today. He's setting you up. In this meeting this morning, God is resurrecting hope. He's resurrecting things that you've put aside on the journey because sometimes we don't turn back, we just park up. And I'm going to challenge you. Every single one of those testimonies that you have heard and hear in the area of what you need the most but hasn't fully happened yet, I want you like to take hold of those jumper leads and say, God, what you've done for him, what you've done for her, what you've written here, that's mine. Let's pray this morning. And right now, whilst you are thinking of things on your journey, because now this is not Jairus' story or a woman with the issue of blood story, it's your story. What do you need today? It's like I want to picture those, those jumper leads coming out of God's Word and, and, and dropping down onto the concrete floor here and flowing that power through because you see, there's the power of God's testimony. Do it again, God. Do it again. Right now, reach into that very area where you need to believe God. Father, I pray the power of Your Word, the testimony of Christ flowing bringing your word and life and power that's coming from you to us, the power of what you've done, the power of what you can do. I pray now for every person in this meeting that right now, Lord, those moments and things where we've, we've been threatened to put aside and stop walking or stop bothering you anymore, we pick those back up again, God. 
And we say, God, thank you for the power. Thank you for the fuel that's come from the fact that I've heard and I've seen and I've, I've read that you've done this before, God. This is, this is something that you do. And so, God, I no longer see myself as less. I no longer see myself, God, as overlooked. I see myself, God, as gifted to and given by what you're doing in the lives of others. It's now mine. So Holy Spirit, release healing. Release your provision. Release stillness, freedom from anxiety, depression, go. The voices, choose one. Lord, your voice is louder and your voice remains.